So one of the fun things about getting ready for this sermon series is everybody kind of knows where I'm going next. And so I get like comments like, I'm really interested in what you're going to say about that next section. And then I have to like, it adds a little bit of anxiety. I got to make sure, like if I better make sure I get that next section right, because, you know, people are, are interested in it. And uh, this next section of scripture is going to be really fun because I think there are certain scriptures that everyone just kind of latches onto. Whether you're a believer or not, like you'll pull these scriptures out of their original context and, and you'll just kind of make it a pretext for, for other types of things, right? Like an example of this and not this particular scripture is uh, Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, we have a, there's a basketball player, Steph Curry, who put that on his shoe. And uh, you can buy Steph Curry shoes that have the, the passage, I can do all things, and it stops there. And, and he's used that verse to find inspiration to, to you know, go after his goals. But if you understand that scripture in the context, what Paul is saying is that I know what it's like to be well-fed, and I know what it's like to be hungry. I have everything that I need. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And so I can't pull that verse out of its original context and, and make believe that it's going to make me shoot higher, you know, jump higher when I shoot or slam dunk or, or I, that I could ever be able to beat Steph Curry in basketball. I would need at least like two weeks practice tops, right? And, and so I know that that's not what the verse says. Now it is okay for people to, to find inspiration in Bible verses. I, I really think it is to find inspiration in Bible verses. But I think before you find the inspiration, you have to understand what it said in its original context. That way you know how to accurately find inspiration from it. How you know how to accurately understand it when you, when you hear it. And today's text that we're going to be going through is one of these verses that everyone seems to love. And when I read it to you, you're going to understand exactly why everyone seems to love this verse. Because it speaks a really great truth in a really clear way. But even the non-religious, they call them nuns right? The non-religious, religious, they hold on to this verse because they like what it says. Sometimes though, they may not really understand exactly what it's saying. And so for us to understand this, we need to put it back into its context, right? We have to put it back to where it belongs so that we can accurately handle the word of truth. And so the scripture that we're going through is in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 6 and going through, through that. But I just want you to look at verse 1 and see if you've ever heard this verse be used out of context. Here's what it says. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, you all should be shaking your head, yes, I've heard people use this verse and, and, and use it in a way that maybe it didn't actually mean what, what it was meant to mean. Now, I love this verse for its clarity and, and uh, what it speaks because it speaks a really beautiful truth. We don't like to be judged, right? Like Steve's talking about his tattoos. He doesn't want somebody coming to a snap judgment about Steve and his tattoos thinking that he is not a good Christian because he has tattoos. And that, that often happens where people come to these snap judgments about people without knowing anything about who they actually are. And so I'm a big fan of this verse that says, don't judge lest you be, or you too will be judged. I like that verse. In fact, gyms, if you, go to, if you go to certain gyms, they have the no judgment zone, right? Like you can work out here without any judgment. And, and I really want to work out in that, that non-judgment zone right? Because if you go outside of that non-judgment zone in the gym, that's where all the bros are at and they're like standing in front of the, the, um, the mirrors and they're taking pictures of their, their biceps and like I don't want to work out over on that side of the gym. I, when it, go, it comes to the gym, I want to work out on the, the no judgment zone part of the gym where like it's fine that I'm on the treadmill sweating like a dog. That's okay. Like I'm working for every pound that I have to lose. I, I would rather be on that side of the gym than, than on the other side that, that is full of judgment. So I understand why people love this verse. No one likes it when people come to a snap decision about you, to just make a judgment without any background knowledge. We can all agree on that, right? But we have to understand this verse may not be saying that we can't make honest assessments, that we can't discern, right? This verse, this, this verse uses a Greek word, it's called, it's krino. 
And it's used both as the noun and the verb. And what it means is, of course, to judge. It's translated judge here. It also means to condemn. And it also means to decide. So what Jesus is saying we, we shouldn't be doing is just coming up to people and making snap decisions about them. That we, we shouldn't be going up to people and condemning them in any way, right? Because the warning here is that if we make snap decisions about people, if we decide on them before we know them, if we condemn them, that's, that's going to happen to us as well. And so we, we know if we just look at the word and what the word actually means, that Jesus is not saying we can't discern. He's saying we shouldn't condemn, we shouldn't judge, we shouldn't decide about people before we know the whole story, right? And, and we would know, even if we didn't go back to the Greek, we would know Jesus is not saying that we can't discern between, between truth. Because in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, in order to know if our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you have to make a judgment. You have to look at their life and you have to compare yourself to that in order to make sure that your, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. Now we understand the righteousness that we're going after is that kingdom righteousness. It's not our righteousness, it's, it's Christ. But you have to make some type of discernment. Jesus continues to talk about judgment on the Sermon on the Mount. Later on in chapter 6, verse 2, he talks about when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law give to the needy, it says, so when they give to the needy, do, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the street corners to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. Here again, we have another story of Jesus looking at people and making some type of judgment about them. Now, he, notice in all of these, he's not condemning them. He's not deciding about them. He's just making a looking at them discerningly and making a, a comparison. It's not the only place. If you look the entire context of the verse that we find this in, Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 6, you're going to see that Jesus is not saying that we can't make discerning judgments. He's saying that we can't condemn or decide about people. Listen to what, what it says, verse 1 through 6. Do not judge or you too will be judged. In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to the dogs what is sacred, and do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. If you look at the whole context, Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the speck. He's saying we have to judge, but judgment starts first with the plank in your own eye. And when you take the plank out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, we are to be people of discernment. We're supposed to stand up for truth, but we have a clear guide to what is true. And it's not your own beliefs. Your guide to what is true is found in Scripture. And so where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we are silent. Right? Where the Bible tells us something, that's the truth that we stand under. But we don't just make up our own snap opinions about people. We don't condemn people. We don't decide about people. That's not our place in the first place. One more verse I want to show you that just shows us that this is what Jesus is talking about. In John chapter uh, 7, he talks about judgment and he talks about the way we're supposed to judge. Verse 24, it says this, Stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. So we have to understand when Jesus says, don't judge or you too will be judged, he's specifically talking about condemning people. He's talking about 
deciding about people without knowing the whole context. He's talking about a hypocritical form of judgment that doesn't look first at the plank. We have to be people of discernment who can understand truth and speak truth when we see it. So let's look at this, this whole text. My first point is when it comes to judgment, the measure you use is what it'll be measured to you. That's my first point. The measure you use is what will be measured to you. And let's look at those first two verses again. Here's what it says. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So there's the principle. It's with the measure you use that's going to be measured back to you, right? When it, when it comes to judgment. And, and I love that idea. Jesus has been very clear about how we're supposed to treat people. And let's just remember what he's talked about just up to this point on the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, he had this horizontal idea of the Beatitudes, how are we supposed to interact with people? In uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So there's our first answer. How do we treat people? We are merciful. Understanding that we have been given mercy, right? If you really want to understand mercy, consider your own plank that you have in your eye and what Christ has done to remove it. How can you look at that and know what you've overcome and not be merciful to other people? So how do we treat people? We're merciful to them. He also goes on to say that uh, we have to be pure in heart, people of integrity. We have to be peacemakers, right? And peacemakers will be called children of God. So when it comes to how we, we interact with people, it's not with a judgmental attitude. It's with an attitude of being a peacemaker. It's with an attitude of being merciful, Later on in chapter 5, he talks about your brother having something against you. And what are you supposed to do? Verse 24 of chapter 5 says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile, and then come offer your gift. So how are we supposed to treat people? Not with judgmental attitudes, but with reconciliation as our goal. Then, And this isn't just... just clear about your brother. In the next verse, he says, if an adversary or somebody that you're opposed to has something against you, make it right right away. He goes on to say that we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us because when we do that, we're proving ourselves to be children of the Father. And then in the verse that I think most clearly reflects the verse that we're looking at is chapter 6, verse 14. And here's what it says. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. So Jesus is giving us this understanding of how we're supposed to interact with people. Don't judge or you too will be judged. And with the same measure you judge, that's what's going to be measured to you. So what is he saying? The way that we treat people is the way that we're going to be treated. So if you want to be harsh, that's fine. If you want to be angry, that's okay too. Just understand that when you're harsh, angry, critical, judgmental, people are going to be harsh, angry, critical, and judgmental right back to you. And how are you ever supposed to be able to share your faith with that type of attitude? But if instead you decide to show mercy and to... to reserve your judgments, not based on, on that first appearance, right? But to reserve your judgments about people and treat them with the type of love that proves you to be a child of the Father and treat them with the forgiveness that you want to receive. Well, see, it's the measure that we use that's going to be measured back to us. I think that's really important we understand and get that because sometimes Christians can be awfully critical. It can be awfully critical just going around pointing the finger at people, but nobody's going to talk back to you when your finger's pointed at them. And now I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't uphold truth. We have the truth. The Word of God is, is the truth, and we should boldly proclaim it. But we should also speak it with love, right? We should speak it with love. And when it comes to judgment, I'm going to leave that to God. Because I know that I have some sin in my life. You guys know that too, right? 
But I thank God that it's none of you that are going to judge me. Right? I, I'm, I, I, I'm thankful that it's none of you because you're cheering on. You're like, amen, you have sin. See, you guys already forgot the first point. It's the measure that you use that's going to be measured back to you. So if you want to, you know, shout amen, you got a crowd shouting back to you. Right? Amen. We, we, that's, that's what we, we, it's the measure that we use. And so I thank God that it's not me setting judgment, but I also thank God it's not you setting judgment. And if you guys think you have nothing to be judged for, come see me because I, I can point some things out, right? I, I can point some things out. In uh, Matthew chapter 25, our next verse, I want to show you who does get to condemn, who does get to decide, who does actually get to judge. And thank God it's not you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. See, it's God, the Son of Man on the throne. None of you, not me, God on the throne. And all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will, se he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. It's God that's on the, the throne. It's God doing the judgment. And it's, it's none of us. And what's really important about that throne is that when God is judging from the throne, his judgment is based on truth. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 2. It, it just says that one statement. Now we know that God's judgment against those do, who do those things is based on truth. Yours is not. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have truth in, in my hand right now. I'm not saying you don't have the truth in your hand. But even reading this every day, you don't know the whole story about people's lives. Do you? You can't know the whole story about people's lives. I, I'm fortunate to, to work with kids, and, and, and I love doing it. But I see kids who struggle mentally because their parents were on drugs when they were born. I see kids who, who go into high school not being able to even read or write because their parents have never read with them at home. And I, I know the direction that these kids are, are being sent off into. And so I, I, when I see that, I just thank God for His grace. I don't come at them with a judgmental attitude. Because I can't judge someone unless I know the circumstances that got them to the place that they're at. Not just the circumstances that got them. I don't know how hard they fought to get out of the circumstances they're at. And more than that, I don't know what would happen to me, but by the grace of God, I wasn't in those same circumstances. And so when it comes to how you treat people, Jesus has made it very clear. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive and it'll be forgiven and do not judge or you too will be judged. And the same measure in all of these things, in the same measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. My second point is that self-judgment brings uh, true discernment. Self-judgment brings true discernment. And uh, I heard this story this week. I thought it was, it was kind of funny. It was, it was about this man who was having uh, trouble communicating with his wife. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. It was like they were just in two different rooms all the time. They, they just didn't, weren't able to communicate in a healthy way. And, and the more he thought about it, he figured, okay, maybe she's having some type of hearing problem. And so one day when she's on the other side of the room facing a different direction, he decided to go back to the other side of the room and, and he asked the question, can you hear me? And there was no response. And so he got a little bit closer and he said, can you hear me now? And there was no response. And then he got right behind her and he said, can you hear me now? And she said, for the third time, yes. I think that tells us something about judgment, right? Like we, we often think that they're the problem, but sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's us that's the problem. And Jesus points this out in Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 3 through 5. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when the whole time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We have to take the plank out of our own eye before we can do anything about the speck in our brothers. And I think this, when I was reading this, my NIV says you pay no attention to the plank that's in your eye, right? I don't know what the, the scripture behind me says because I have a more updated version of the NIV than Kathy has on her computer because she refuses to upgrade, right? But maybe you have like one of those more reliable uh, versions of the Bible like uh, the New American Standard. If you do, it doesn't say you pay no attention to the speck. It says you don't even notice that there's a speck in your eye. And it's just a subtle difference, and it, it's just about when they were interpreting, interpreting the verse, like, which direction should I go with that? I really like the idea that they don't even notice that it's there. There's a plank in their eye, and they're so consumed with what everybody else has going on around them, the specks of sawdust, that they don't even notice what's going on in their own life. That happens all the time. Christians walking around pointing the fig finger without realizing they have this giant plank in their eye. Jesus has used an analogy of an eye over and over again on the Sermon on the Mount. It's not the first time he used it. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 7, he says, If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it into the fire. Right? Why? Because if what you're looking at is causing you to, to sin, you should go to the most extreme to make sure that you're only looking at the most healthy things. So don't go gouging out your eyes. I explained that when I preached that sermon. Don't go gouging out your eyes. But remember, what it is that you bring in through your eyes can be really, really dangerous. Later on, he uses the eye again, and he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is full of darkness. The eye, again, there is used to say, talk about that thing that you, you bring in, that, what shapes your worldview, right? The eye, which shapes your worldview and, and shows you how to perceive the world around you. And here's the next time he uses the eye. And again, you see how it's the eye that can cause a major problem. How many ever had a speck of sawdust or a, a piece of pollen or something? It's irritating. Nobody wants to walk around with sawdust in their eye. In fact, it hurts. The difference between the sawdust and the plank, well, the plank is much, much, much worse, right? But everybody can see a plank. Like, if I have a piece of sawdust in my eye, I, I mean, I have to tell you about it, right? Or you see me blinking and starting to cry. But it's still an irritant. It's not like you want that speck of sawdust in your eye. But... The problem is, is that you have a plank in your own eye. And how, how can you do anything about sawdust if you have a plank? Amen with contact lenses. I don't wear them, but I'm sure that we have some that have contact lenses. There's this story in Samuel. And how many in here have pets? I was thinking about my pet when I read this story. Just so you know. Um, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And, and what happens here is David had just had uh, Uriah killed because he wanted to um, take Bathsheba to be his wife. And so David takes Bathsheba. And now Nathan, who is a prophet, is going to go talk to David. And he's going he's gonna to tell him what he did wrong, but he's not going to just be direct about it. He's going to give him a parable. So this story doesn't actually happen. It's a parable of, that represents what David did to Uriah. And here's what it says, uh, 2 Samuel verse tw or chapter 12. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There was two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except a little ewe lamb that he bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. See those pets that I'm talking about? It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare the meal for his traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and prepared it for him, for the one who had come to him. 
David burned with anger against that man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. That's such a, such a tragic story when you think about it. Like David's burning with anger because somebody did something like that. Burning with anger. And then Nathan flips it on him and says, oh yeah, that's the plank that's in your eye. It's really easy to burn with anger whenever we think of the sins that are going on in other people's lives. But at some point we have to flip it around and realize that's the plank that is in our own eye. And so to really understand discernment in this world, it starts with self-judgment. It starts with, with looking inward at yourself to figure out wh- how you're living and what's going on in your life. And you know what I find mo- happens most when I start to look and take that judgment inward? It makes me more compassionate. It makes me more merciful. Because when I realize how much I've been forgiven, It's a lot easier to show that forgiveness to other people, isn't it? In Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about the wrath of God being poured out against all the ungodliness and wickedness of men. He says they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. And then he gives a list. And you can read it. It's a long list of those wicked Gentiles and everything they do wrong. It's a long list. He goes over it. I mean, everything from idolatry to disobeying parents, Paul puts in there. He wants you at the end of chapter one to be thinking those wicked Gentiles. And then he comes to chapter two and it's like he drops a bomb on the book and he says, you who pass judgment have no excuse because the same things you do. I'll read it because I misquoted it so badly. Chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. And all those, those Jews that were so happy to be pointing the finger at the Gentiles had to take a deep breath and say, I guess it's me too. Now, that doesn't mean that the list of things that Paul said in chapter 1 weren't actually wrong. They were. But judgment starts first here. It starts first in the house of God. It starts first with you. And when you begin to judge yourself, you can see clearly to judge another. And I'm so out of time. Jesus goes on to say that you're being hypocritical. We talked about what it means to be hypocritical. It's you're an actor. You're somebody's playing a part. So you can't be honest about yourself because you're playing the part of another. And he says, If you're trying to judge your brother who has sawdust in your eye while you have a plank, you're a hypocrite. And he gives us some direction in in verse 5. He tells us that we have to take the plank out of our own eye, right? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see how to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Once again, I'm pointing out that the speck is still a problem. It's not like Jesus is saying we should not be going after and and proclaiming truth to a world. He does believe that we're supposed to proclaim truth. In fact, there's some warnings later on in the Sermon on the Mount that's going to scare us maybe just a little bit. We have to proclaim truth. He's not saying the sawdust doesn't matter. What he is saying is start by judging yourself first. And by judging yourself first, you find yourself being a lot more compassionate to people. And that's why uh, Matthew chapter 18 talks about how we're supposed to go and deal with people who are in sin. And he says, if you find a brother sinning, go to him and restore him gently. And I'm sure it's behind me. I'm not going to read it. But go and and see, we we have to use discernment. When we see people sinning, we go and, and, and talk to them one-on-one, gently. And if they don't listen, then we take some people with us. And if they still don't listen, then we bring it up to the church. And if they still don't listen, we treat them like a tax collector or a sinner. But I love what Ken said about this. How did Jesus treat tax collectors and sinners? He ate with them. So I, I, I guess even, even when we, we want to point the finger and say, sinner, 
that doesn't give us an excuse to treat people poorly. I'm going to wrap up my last point in like a minute, and then I'll have you guys out of here. My last point is Christians are not to be gullible. See, if you thought as you read this that we're not supposed to make any judgments, then you weren't listening, or I didn't say it correctly. We, we are supposed to make judgments, but not based on, on ourselves, but based on Scripture and what Scripture says. And uh, not everybody wants to hear that. In fact, not everybody, like when we're out there telling people, I don't, I don't know how to say it other than we're not supposed to be gullible. We're, have to, we're supposed to, to know about the people that we're pouring into their lives and they're pouring into ours. Look at what Jesus says in, in verse 6, because this is probably the harder part of, of this no judgment thing. In verse 6, it says, Do not give to dogs what is sacred, and do not throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, there has to be some discernment there. I mean, can you tell the difference between a dog and a pig? There's some discernment there. Je Jesus is using dogs and pigs in a metaphorical way, and we don't have to guess at it. We know how he used these types of terms. He uses them over and more than one time. In fact, in that culture, it was common to use these terms, to call Gentiles dogs because they ate any type of meat, and to call Gentiles pigs because they were unclean. Now, he's not talking about like babe or like, Coco, or like, you know, your little fuzzy dog. He's talking about like wild beasts, right? And he's like saying, don't throw what is sacred in front of dogs and pigs. And I, I struggled with this verse all week. I want you to know that. I don't know that Jesus is being outright insulting, but it's hard to, to, to look at it any other way. We have to use discernment when we're sharing things with people. And I, I, I questioned why, and then I came across this proverb. It's in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. It says, do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke, a wise, rebuke the wise and they will love you. If I had to think of who the dog and the pig is in the story, I have to point my, my finger first at myself. I was the dog. I was the pig. And there were some people trying to pour into my life that I would have never listened to. In fact, they would have been wasting their time. And then it took January to be like, we're going to church. And uh, I just followed her right along. Right? Flirty fishing, I guess. I followed her right along. I don't know that pointing your finger at people all the time is, is necessarily going to help them. And I don't know the, what is sacred here is, is the kingdom. It's the message of the kingdom. And uh, sometimes people aren't open and receptive to that. And so you have to give them time. Pray for them. Treat them with mercy. Treat them with love. But don't throw what is sacred in front of them. It took somebody else like January to get me to go to church. And when I went to church, that's where I met Jesus. Anybody else would have tried to, to tell me about him. I wasn't ready to listen. But when Jesus met me there at First Christian Church, something about me and my life changed. And I was baptized just the next week, full, fully dressed in jeans and a shirt, because that's what God had called me to do. I think God is calling all of us to go out and to preach the message of the kingdom, those sacred things, the pearls. The message of the kingdom has to be preached with mercy, with love, with forgiveness, without condemning people or deciding about them but we have to speak the truth and we have to uphold the truth and when people aren't willing to listen to it Jesus would say something like dust off your sandals and go on to the next help I want to encourage you to just be people that are kingdom people to love as Jesus loved to show mercy as Jesus showed mercy to forgive as Jesus forgave and to not go around condemning because that's not our job.